So welcome to this virtual tutorial on uh, version control with Git. Now, what's the idea of today? Um, I'm going to motivate to you why you would want to use version control. Maybe you already do, maybe you know you want to, but I'll give you a little um, motivation about why. Then I will suggest why you might want to use Git. Reason, reasons might be less complicated than, than uh, you might imagine. Um, We'll go over some basics. I should stress, this is this is a basic introduction tutorial to Git. Uh, so if you're already uh, using Git every day quite comfortably, you probably won't find much new in here. But um, it might solidify some concepts. So I'll go, go over getting started using Git. Uh, I'll review some of the basic terms and concepts so that these are really clear in your mind. Um, we'll go over some basic workflow and a couple of gotchas and subtleties that can that can crop up and they're useful to know about. I'll just step then take I'll take a step back and compare Git to some other version control tools um, and see how they how they kind of differ. Um, again, not in any great technical detail, but just so you have an idea of what's going on under the hood, so to speak. Then I'll talk briefly about additional features offered by uh, websites like GitHub and GitLab, um, what these give us in addition to the basic version control tool of Git, namely forking, pull requests, issue tracking, continuous integration by means of testing. And finally, I'll sketch a few distributed workflows. Feel free at any point um, to ask questions in the, in the chat window. Okay, so why do we care about version control? So when it comes to either writing um, documents or writing software, we often end up in a situation where we have different versions. We start off with something. If it's code, it might be a single file or a bunch of files. Uh, that's our initial code. Then find out it doesn't work. So we edit, edit, edit. We find something that finally works. Uh, that could be our version 0.2, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Then we make some other changes to make the make the code go faster. Okay, that's great. So we end up with our final code. That's that's all fine and well. Um, and uh, but what happens if the situation is a bit more complex? So what happens if we have the following situation, where you start off with some initial code, doesn't work. So you make it work. And then let me see if I can get an arrow to, in, to actually point um, pointer. Yes, so you should be able to see a little hand icon pointing. So you get some code that works and then you make it go faster. That's great. Oh, but actually you go back and you realize, well, the entire algorithm I'm using is kind of, is very kind of conventional. So I'm gonna try and implement a new algorithm for the same thing that I want to do. A new algorithm that's been published, you found a publication, it looks like it like it would be really useful for your for your code. So um, you implement that in your code. So you end up with another version of your code, the different algorithm version. We'll call that version D to refer back to it later with a single letter. Now suppose that you have some colleagues, um, Alice and Bob, uh, that are very enthusiastic about your faster code based on the original algorithm. And they say, okay, this is great, but actually um, there's some stuff, stuff I want to do with this code. Alice says that, so she adds some new functionality. So she takes a copy uh, of, your, of your faster code and adds some new functionality. Meanwhile, Bob is um, saying, well, I don't really trust your results. Uh, they look promising, but I don't really trust them. So I'm gonna add some, some tests to see if the stuff you've, you've coded up actually works and if it works for particular well-defined test cases that I care about. So that results in a new version of the code B. So Alice's version was A, Bob's version is B. Meanwhile, you yourself um, are thinking, yeah, actually I've, I've coded up all this maths stuff, all these functions there, linear algebra, whatever they might be for your transforms um, or some very specific um, functionality for your, for your um, application. Actually, there's an external library that does this already. So really what I want to try and do is use the external library because it should be a lot, uh, lot, lot faster potentially or offer more functionality. So you go away and you take, a, you know, you're, in your copy of the code that you've got, you start editing and edit, adding functionality to use the uh, external library, leading to a third 
um, version of the code C. Fourth, so we've got A, B, C, and D. Now, assume Alice's new functionality is implemented correctly. Assume Bob's add tests were implemented correctly. You've um, implemented your external library code and that all works. Now, the question is, uh, what to do now? So ideally, you would like to have a version of the code that incorporates all of these things, but that assumes that uh, there is no conflict between any of these functionalities. There's no intercompatibility problems. So how do you do this? Well, unless you've used the version control tool, if you're doing all of this manually, you will literally manually have to copy and paste the code. You'll have to copy and paste the right code from the right place from versions A, B, C, and D to produce, for example, a version that incorporates A, B, C, and D, which you can imagine is um, very error prone. Of course, you could want something simpler. You could, you could go for something that just uses A and B, something that uses C and D, but the main idea of why you want something more systematic than, than manually copying, pasting things and copies of files is motivated by this. You've got one or more files and very quickly it starts to become completely unmanageable to do this manually. So version control tools, they provide a framework to, to manage this complexity. So they allow you to record meaningful, meaningful information about versions in a systematic and consistent way. Um, and then they allow you to go back and, re and revisit or recover past versions, which includes, um, as I said, multiple files. So there will be, there will be for, for a given, so we're talking about, for example, um, your different algorithm implementation, those files, all the files in your, in your code base might have some interdependencies. So version control tools allow you to create snapshots in time that capture those interdependencies and preserve them um, so that, that, you know, that snapshot works, that's functional. Um, and the version control tools also automate the tracking of the changes between versions. And, and ultimately, a lot of this is, is geared towards being able to do the thing that I said we wanted to do, which is to combine these changes into, into functioning, meaningful, non-broken code. So, uh, also, version control tools are really useful for uh, facilitating reproducible research because once you've started recording version information in a systematic way, and once you have the ability to revisit previous versions of the code, not by happening to find an email that you sent to your colleague with the copies or happening to find um, some USB um, uh, drive in a backpack somewhere that, that contains a copy that has that particular functionality. No, but by having everything stored in, in one place, uh, all the versions of the code, so that when you run the code, when you run a simulation, um, say you're running a, a simulation that actually produces results that you end publishing in re for your research, then when you publish that, you can mark those simulation results as having been generated with a particular version of the code, and you can make it exactly clear to, to anybody, um, if, you, if you make your code public, you can make it exactly clear which uh, version of the code was used to generate those results, which is a big deal in reproducibility. What version control tools also allow you to do is they make it much easier to duplicate and synchronize files across multiple locations, so across multiple machines. So if you're not having to do sort of error-prone manual syncing, transferring, which allows you to therefore work on different machines um, and also uh, helps maintain backups of, of your data, of your code. Now I've already talked about an example I gave about having colleagues, Alice and Bob, that collaborate or that do things to your code. And this is in fact a really key aspect of, of version control um, and how we use these tools, namely that they enable collaborative work on software namely on the same file or the same set of files uh, at the same time by different people. And they keep track of things so that ultimately we can, in a, in a, in a reliable way, manage um, combining the contributions from different developers, from different authors. So on the whole, uh, version control tools are just 
crucial or critical to um, to software development project and for doing things in a sustainable way. So that's a general motivation for version control. Why is this virtual tutorial about Git? Um, why might you want to use Git? Well, you may have no choice. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a fact of the matter that over the last uh, number of years, Git has become increasingly popular. Um, so as you can see, these are some search term trend uh, trends for up, since 2004. Um, up until not quite the present day, day, but you can see the relative popularity of um, Git in green versus other version control tools like Mercurial or SVN, then Subversion, CVS, has really um, skyrocketed as, as much, much larger. So what that means is that effectively, Git dominates um, software de development, especially, especially open source software development, um, quite generally. Uh, and as a result, um, or gradually more and more, it also dominates the development of software for computational science as used in academia. So when I said you have no choice, I meant that, um, okay, just because something is used by a lot of people doesn't mean you have to use it. In fact, you could use whatever you like, but if you're working on an existing software project, um, then many of them will use Git. So you're very likely to come across it. And you may not even be wanting to work on software. You may just simply want to download software. Um, and even that, even then it can sometimes be useful to, to know about Git uh, and GitHub. So I mentioned GitHub. So um, if it's familiar to many people. So, so there, there are some popular online hosting and uh, um, collaborative tools, websites for software development that target usage of Git. Examples are GitHub and GitLab. So as I said, we'll now have a look at getting started with Git. We'll start by really clarifying some of the concepts, some of the basic concepts. And once these are clear, um, you should hopefully have a much better idea about uh, when you come to tutorials where you're trying to do more complicated things, or simply in your in your day-to-day -day basic usage, you'll have a, a clear idea of what's on, what's going on under the hood, what the key concepts are, and what therefore is going on when things go wrong. So the repository, also referred to uh, as repo, is is basically all all the data. So it's a complete archive that contains a full history of all the uh, versions of files that were recorded at points in the past. So, so the, all, in other words, it record, it's an archive of all the snapshots that were taken in the past. And with Git, these are stored as the differences, i.e. the deltas, between successive versions. Now, Git repositories are stored on your local machine. That is to say, when you're working with Git, there's always uh, a local repository, a local Git repository residing on your machine. And notice that I say a Git repository and also the Git repository, because the thing about Git is that, as I will come to later, it's an example of um, the so-called decentralized or um, uh, distributed version control system. So unlike some of these older version control systems like Subversion, SVN, and CVS, which are centralized, where, the repo where, is, where there is one canonical repository that resides on a remote server, uh, Git works a bit differently. So if, you, um, if there's a, a Git repository that already exists, for example, on a server somewhere on, on GitHub, then you would uh, get this, obtain it, locally using the command git clone. Um, or if you are creating a, a repository from scratch, you would use the git init command. So the next concept is uh, commit. The verb to commit. To commit means to simply take a snapshot of the current state of one or more files and to record that snapshot in the repository. So we often refer to a commit. So a commit, as a noun, is a snapshot, is one of these snapshots. So a repository is basically um, composed of 
a series of commits. And talking about series of commits, one of the key concepts with Git, more so than with other older version control systems, is that of a branch. So a branch is a series of successive snapshots, i.e. series of commits of one or more files, which are stored in the repository. And all Git repositories contain at least one branch. This is uh, always called the master branch. Now, to branch, to the act of branching, uh, which you initiate by using the command git branch, is to create a new branch. Now, what does that mean? The new branch, which is an offshoot from the current branch, is um, initialized with copies of the current versions of all the files that are in the current branch. So if you are in the master branch and you create a new branch, then that new branch will contain copies of the current versions of all the files as they exist on the master branch. Now, why do we have branches? A uh, big reason is to uh, be able to pursue routes of development in isolation from the main code. So typically branches are created to add new functionality and to do so in a way that isolates these changes uh, so that the existing code is not directly affected, but at a later stage, um, as we come to in a second, you can combine the changes that you will have made with the original code. Um, and you can have, in, in general, you can have many, many, many branches. That's something we'll come back to. So next concept, related concept, uh, immediately following this idea of branching is kind of the converse, which is to merge. So merging, done with a command git merge, means to combine two branches by merging one into the other. So what does that mean? It means that you're asking, when you're, when you're telling git to perform a merge, you're asking it to combine the changes that have been made on one branch with the current version in another branch. When that happens, it will automatically look at, because it knows where all those changes have been made on both branches, it will detect where there are any conflicts, if there are any conflicts being where you've edited the same file in the same place, um, and will offer these for resolution. So you will need to then, you yourself will need to uh, resolve these, these so-called conflicts. Of course, Basic, I mean, version control tools, they make things a lot simpler, they make your life simpler, but they are not, um, <laughs> they're not artificial intelligence that know how you want to, to combine things. So um, they don't magically combine things. If, if you have modified the same part of your code, you yourself will need to step in and make any resolutions, but they make things very much more systematic. So why do we merge? Well, as I hinted at before with the branching, you merge because you want to reintegrate some new feature that you've developed on the separate branch back into the main code base, which could be back into the master branch or back or into a different branch. You would do this typically after the new feature has been uh, tested, is found to work successfully. Before that point, you would probably keep on developing it on your new branch. Another concept, key concept for Git is the concept of the working tree, the working directory. So the working directory, um, it's what you type, it's what you see when you type ls when you're inside a repository. So wherever you are on your machine and you, do, you type git clone of some repository as we'll, as we'll show in an example, then you enter that repository and when you type ls, what you see is the working tree or the working directory. And what that is, is a local view of the files on one branch of the repository. So by default, this will be the master branch. So when you first clone a repository and you don't specify any details, any options, the default behavior will be that when you look at what's there, it is what's there 
in the master branch. We'll come on later how you can change that. So um, in a command line in a shell, and we're assuming that when you start out with this, you might like to start using Git uh, from the command line rather than graphical user interfaces, just because it will give you some initial um, experience uh, directly. Um, uh, so, and when you use the shell or command line, you are uh, limited to seeing, uh, as I said, as I just described, you're limited to seeing uh, just one branch at any given time. And what you see in your working directory, um, unless you've only literally just cloned the repository, will be uh, the current state of the files, which you know, as you have edited them, or as you've added files or removed files, will differ from what's actually in the current branch stored in the repository. Now, uh, I said you can only see one branch at any given time. To change this, you want to change to, if you want to change to a different branch, you uh, name, for example, one that you've just created, you would need to check, check this branch out. So that's what we call checkout. So this is done with a command to get to checkout. And what it does is uh, switches your working directory view from the current branch to another branch. Another concept is the, the log, which you can see using the command git log. And this is a um, human readable record showing the version history. Um, it basically shows for the branch that you're looking at, uh, when changes were made and committed, and uh, some, hopefully some description of what those changes are as, as they were made by the author of those changes who committed them at the time. So when you commit, well, I'll come to committing in a second, so you always, you always need to um, add some information. So um, what I've talked about so far has been, um, well, relevant for, um, managing your local repository. But there are, there are two commands that are key when you're interacting with remote repositories, namely pushing and pulling. So to push, so here's, here's something to understand. So a key thing to understand about Git is that when you're talking about committing something, committing a snapshot, what you're doing is you're committing to your local repository. It doesn't matter if you cloned that repository from something that lives elsewhere. When you are committing something, it, those changes are committed only to the repository that lives on the machine where you are working on. Now the push command, what that does is if the local repository that you're working on originated by being cloned from another remote repository, then the push command uploads the commits that you have made since the last time you pushed. It uploads those to the corresponding remote repository. So, and the default behavior there is that when you say git push without any other options, it pushes um, the commits that have been made to the current branch to the corresponding remote so-called upstream branch. You can define alternative behavior, but that's all in the manual on the help, help pages. Um, if you try to push and there are conflicts between the state of your, the state of the branch in your local repository and the state of the corresponding branch in the remote repository, then it will not succeed. What you will need to do then is first to pull the changes from the remote repository into your local repository, somehow resolve the changes and then push. We'll come back to this. So pulling with the command, done with the command git pull, is um, to conversely, to download the commits from a remote repository and to merge them into your local repository. And if you, <clears throat> if you don't specify any options, then the default behavior of git pull is to pull from um, the remote branch that corresponds to the current branch you are on and to merge those commits into the current branch. So this is a bit like um, in, in older version control tools what co corresponds to update. 
like the SVN update command. It's a bit like that. Um, it actually consists of two subcommands, namely git fetch and git merge. Fetch downloads and merge does the actual merging um, into the current branch. And this is where any conflicts that exist will become apparent. And so you resolve these conflicts locally. Now, some basic workflows with Git. So you have an idea of the basic concept. Let's look at some very basic workflows. So um, in the simple case where uh, there's no repository yet, but you've got some files and you want to start using, you want to start putting them under version control using Git. Um, so there is no remote repository. There's no local repository yet. You want to create one. To do that, you use the command git init. That creates your repository. Then you use the command git add, file names that you want to add. Finally, followed with the git commit command, the dash m option specifies uh, a, a description, a commit message. And that will, have an, that, that will then initialize your repository and add the initial files. All you want to do, if you, if, 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 if you don't want to share this with anybody else, if you just want to keep this for your own purposes and keep the revision history, all you need to do from then on is whenever you modify your files or add new files, just add the modified files, add the new files, commit, and repeat, etc. So that's a simple private repository. Now, when we come to um, a basic workflow for working with a shared repository, so I'm imagining here that you're working on um, some code or it could even be um, a document. So you're working on a, say you're working on a shared software project as a member of the development team who say you, you know as direct colleagues, so it could be one other person, it could be a, a bigger team. Let's assume that the project, that there's software, there's software that exists and that software lives in a repository, in a Git repository um, on a remote server, uh, for example, uh, the GitHub website. So, that, and let's assume that you want to develop a new feature in the software. So the first step is to clone your project locally with the Git clone and the URL of the repository. Um, then you want to create a new branch for your feature with the command git branch. Now, Something to keep in mind is that once you create a new branch, you don't actually automatically check it out unless you use some options. So you need to explicitly check out that branch before you can start editing that branch and making commits to that branch. So you do, so you do git checkout name of your branch. Then you modify and add files, develop your new feature, um, and, and commit these. And you, you run through that for a um, cycle of modifying, adding, and committing uh, however many times you want. And it's a good idea to push these changes, um, not too infrequently, just in case, I suppose, your, your, say your laptop or your, if it, if it is your laptop that you're using, if, the, if that gets you know, broken or caught on a bus, it's a good idea to always, um, good idea to push. It's a good idea to, if you're, if you're coding during the day and before you head home, it's a good idea to push before you go home, just in case you get hit by a bus and your laptop gets crushed. So at least your code will live on. Um, anyway, so, to push those changes, you do git push, and that has the default uh, behavior. So what we're what we're thinking of here is a situation where you might be the only person contributing to that branch. So you're not expecting any conflicts. You're just expecting that um, you're committing changes to that branch, to the feature branch, and you're pushing those changes uh, to the remote repository. And that, and that would be, you're pushing them to the remote repository so that A, it's a backup, B, uh, it becomes visible to others on your team so they can kind of see what you're working on and how progress is, is coming along. Potentially, you're working on something that they need to coordinate with and look at um, making interoperable with. They can, they can, that, that visibility means that they can, they can make the right changes. Um, also, as we'll come to later, you, the reason you might push is because it will might set off some tests that could run automatically to test whether the code that you've just created actually does the right thing, doesn't break anything. Um, now, so that's the first part of this shared project development workflow. 
namely you creating the branch and you are pushing to the branch and it's just all about your work in isolation of the rest of the code. Once the feature has been developed successfully and it's tested and it's been shown to have the desired functionality and also not break any of the, of the existing code, typically you, you might wanna integrate that new feature into the main code base, into the main code. For example, to create a release of the software. Uh, or to make sure that um, it can interact with new functionality that your colleagues are developing. So to do this, you will need to do some kind of merge and you'll need merges are done locally. So what you will do is you will first, if you're going, if, if you're going to merge your new feature branch into the master branch, which may not be a good idea, but I'll, let's just assume this very simple situation for now, then you would first need to make sure that your local, um, master branch is is uh, up to date with the master branch in the remote repository that, that this repository is, is based on. So to do that, uh, you would switch from your feature branch to the master branch with the command git checkout master. Then if you run git pull, you'll pull all the, la all the latest changes that have been made to the master branch while you were busy developing your feature branch, which may be a matter of days or weeks or months, depending then you will locally perform on your machine the merge of your new of your feature branch into the master branch with a command git merge my feature and by default that 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 um, that merges into the current branch which is the master branch which you've, because you've checked that out once you've resolved any conflicts if there are any you can then push the result um, to share with collaborators and with the world so we're assuming that at that at that stage, the functionality of, of the new feature has already been tested successfully, uh, which is a good practice to do before you start um, modifying uh, the main sort of the main branch or the master branch. And a note here is that, as I said, it might not be a good idea to to modify the master branch because it's it's risky because resolving conflicts can get messy. There's things you might not have taken into account. Uh, you need to make sure that um, you're coordinate, coordinating how the code is changing with other people contributing to the code. So often, or, I mean, most development workflows don't necessarily merge directly into the master branch. You would typically merge into intermediary development branches. We'll say a bit about this later. It's a couple of um, subtleties or gotchas, things to keep in mind, things that might trip you up with Git. There are actually lots of things that might trip you up, up with Git, but it's um, kind of impossible to, to list them all in this in this um, short tutorial. But here are a couple of things. So the one thing that always confuses people, well, especially, it can, it can confuse people anyway, regardless of whether they've never used version control or, or whether they're coming from an older version control system like Subversion or CVS. Namely, the first thing on this list is that Git has the notion of an index so what this is, is, so we've talked about committing files. So committing files is actually a two-stage process. So you, you typically don't type git commit, you know, after, after making changes, you typically don't simply type git commit, um, or rather you can do, but there are some additional options you would need to use to, to, to make that work. Typically there's a two, it's a two-stage process whereby um, you make some changes to files and you then tell Git that you intend to commit the current state of those files. And this note, note of telling Git that you intend to commit these files adds them to the index. So you do this using the git add command. Um, so the index is a staging area or cache, um, which just it basically keeping track of the files that will be committed the next time that you type git commit. It sounds really complicated, it is really complicated, um, and it can trip you up. But uh, when in doubt, you should just use the command to git status, and that will tell you what's going on. Git status will tell you what branch you're on currently. It will tell you what's in the index, so what is scheduled to be committed. And also, it will give a breakdown of how the current state of the working tree um, compares to the repository. So with regards to the current branch that you're on, it will show you files that have been 
um, mod that are already being tracked in the repository and have been modified and scheduled to be committed. Files that are already tracked in the repository and have been modified but are not yet scheduled to be committed. Um, in which case it'll suggest you, you schedule these to commit them. And files that uh, are new and are not yet tracked, in which case you may want to add them to be committed for the very first time. So when in doubt, use git status, and that will tell you a lot more about what's going on. Um, and the thing that trips up people is that existing tracked files that are modified, you need to add them explicitly to the index every time to make sure they're included in a commit. So uh, another gotcha is if you go off and try a simple, some simple examples and you create a new branch, when you create a new branch locally, and then try to push that to a remote repository, it will by default fail unless you specify some additional options. You can specify these option, some option either when you push at the time when you push the newly created branch or when you create it in the first place. So the, these are the dash dash set upstream options or the track options. So there's, you, can, you can Google this or look at um, the help uh, by doing git branch dash dash help or git push dash dash help. When you're using Git, you will see sometimes cryptic references to something called head, all capitals, head. Head is a reference to the most recent commit on whatever branch you are currently working on. That's something to keep in mind. Let's have a comparison now. Uh, take a step back at how Git compares to other version control tools. Um, I've said that Git is an example of a, of a centralized, decent, decentralized or distributed version control tool. Mercurial is another example. Other control tools like CVS and Subversion are centralized. Um, and I've already said what this amounts to. So another key difference is that Git has a much greater em emphasis on an efficiency using branches, which allows for much more complex and flexible workflows. Um, so I'm going to go quite quickly through these next few slides because they just talk about how distributed version control works in general. The idea being that um, if you, so each person that has a, a local repository, you don't need to have a central server, but it's very, very, very useful and often in practice almost always used. A new user will clone an existing repository. Users can make changes in the local repositories on whatever branch they want to then to combine these changes, somebody will have to pull somebody else's changes, then merge them into the relevant branches. Uh, one of the people who made these changes in the first place can do it, Dave or Carol in this case, or Alice can pull the, the branches from uh, both these people and then merge them. As I said, we often use a centralized server for convenience. So the clone would happen from, by both Carol and Dave from the central server. Carol and Dave both make changes. They push these changes to the server. Um, if they both had made changes to the same branch, for example, master branch, then the first one that commits wins, so to speak. And then if Carol commits first, her changes will be put into, into the remote repository. Dave will then find that it doesn't work for him. He has to then first pull the changes from the server, merge them with his changes on the master branch, and then push them back to the server so others can see them. Uh, and others can then, can then pull these um, again to update. Oh, this is okay. These are, that's more complicated, it's not, not interesting. So um, the advantage of, of distributed version control in Git in comparison to all these older version control tools is that you don't need to be onli online to make changes. So actually that's, that was one of the reasons for originally developing Git in that way. Um, you don't need to be online. You can commit changes privately, which means that you can be, you know, you can be encouraged to commit often early on, even when things don't work yet. So at least you're keeping track of things, uh, as opposed to older models where this would immediately end up on a central server, uh, which might not be desirable. So um, as I said, there's a lot of workflows that you can adopt as a result of this flexibility. Uh, and many of these, because you're doing things locally, many of these common operations can be faster, even though Git is also quite efficient network-wise. So some additional features. So Git, um, the kind of ecosystem that has grown up around Git uh, provides 
some hosting and additional features. And actually, this is part of what's made Git so popular. Uh, so um, websites like GitHub and tools like GitLab, they've helped fuel this trend of growth for Git. So what these offer is, basically, they are the central servers on which your repositories can live. But they're not just that. Uh, they also have, offer uh, um, some sophisticated management, repository management, and collaborative features um, that are very useful. So what are some of these features? What you have is a so-called issue tracker. So what you can do is, on the website, on GitHub, you can um, keep track of bugs that have been reported by users or by yourself, uh, things that you would like to implement, things that people have requested. And this can be a basis for discussion between developers that are contributing to decide on the, or to make the design, design decisions and ultimately to implement um, these decisions uh, by creating a new branch and then by committing to this branch. And um, when this code becomes integrated into the, into the main code, that can be documented by uh, uh, by means of tags. So basically what happens is that when you create a commit, you can make a reference by, by means of a, of a tag to issues that have been, to, to basically conversation threads on the wiki on GitHub. And when you then push this commit, it closes an issue so that you have a very direct link uh, and documentation of uh, bugs, feature requests, and how, they, how these have been tackled and resolved in particular versions of the code and how these can be, how that can be obtained. So that, that can be very useful um, if you're trying to find which version of the software has a, has a bug release, et cetera, et cetera. So the issue tracker is a very useful feature. Um, and this exists for, um, for GitHub as well as for GitLab. I'll say, uh, I'll say at the bottom what GitLab is, but uh, another very useful feature is um, uh, so-called pull requests. So there's a so there's a mechanism that has become a very common workflow, which is to which is fork, clone, pull request. So what this means is that um, what what GitHub allows people to do, developers to do, is uh, you can clone a pop, you can clone a repository within GitHub, which is also known as forking. And what that does, it, it creates a copy of a repository which you then have right access to. In other words, which you can then make changes to. This does not require you to have right access to be able to actually push changes to the original repository, which probably the developers would only want um, people that they know very well and that, are, that they're working with directly and collaborating with directly to be able to do. So the reason why this is, is nice is that um, it allows anybody to um, make changes to code. And once they've, once they've made these changes and they've, they've either fixed the bug or introduced some new feature, and they, they would like uh, to, to integrate these changes into the original repository, they can then do what's called a pull request or merge request. So what, they, what that means is that uh, within GitHub um, or GitLab, you can um, issue a request to the original, to the owners of the original repository that they essentially merge the changes you have made in your fork of their repository into their repository. And they can then inspect uh, whether, whether your changes have um, succeeded in solving the issue before they accept this. And, and this is a way of managing um, uh, bug fixes and keeping, keeping um, things sort of clean, but also making it much easier to engage um, uh, any public developers uh, who wants to into, into contributing to a project. Another feature is to do with uh, facilitating continuous integration and testing. So I've talked about running tests when you push a commit. Um, what you can do is within GitHub and GitLab, you can set up so-called pipelines or jobs that run server side after a commit is pushed. 
And what they might do is you can, they're very flexible. You can define them to, to do all kinds of things. What they can do is run a suite of tests, say, um, that exercise your code and see if the results uh, match expected results. So this is this can be used for, I guess, testing new functionality as you, as you um, integrate it, or for making sure that you don't break existing, already existing code. So uh, can really help with regression testing and automating the process of regression testing. Uh, and this, as, as a code base becomes more and more complex, it uh, becomes really valuable because there might be unexpected side effects from new features that have been developed in isolated branches. And it's very important that these are tested before they're integrated into the main code. I'm, I've been talking about GitHub a lot, but there's also GitLab. And GitLab is, is essentially offers very similar functionality to GitHub. Both of, both of them are continuously developing the particular features that they support. Um, there's a free version of GitLab and a, and a paid for version of GitLab or enterprise version. And essentially what GitLab, so GitHub is what well, was recently acquired by Microsoft. Um, whereas GitLab, so, so GitHub is used as a service using the website github.com. GitLab is just a piece of software which allows you to set up your own GitHub-like instance that you host yourself on whatever infrastructure you like, which you therefore have complete control over. So that can be desirable both in terms of privacy um, uh, and just payment and, 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 um, and policy and what you implement, um, providing your own, own infrastructure. So finally, I'd just like to talk about a couple of a couple of workflows, a couple of examples of the kinds of workflows that Git allows. Um, so some of the more complicated ones might be more common in a, in a really sort of fully fledged, a large scale commercial software development, but even in, in, in many scientific uh, applications, which can get very complex, it, it's useful. Um, it can come in handy. It's useful to know about anyway. So this this example of a distributed workflow is the so-called integration manager workflow. And it assumes that you have one um, so-called blessed repository or canonical repository. So this is the, uh, the repository that you know, people try to keep as, as clean as possible. And uh, developers will uh, pull from this repository. Developers who are wanting to contribute to this, to this um, code will pull from this repository um, into um, their private uh, directly into their private um, um, repository. So they will have cloned the blessed repository and then pull the latest uh, from it. Then they will make some changes and they won't have right access to be able to directly merge into the blessed repository because they're not blessed enough, I suppose. So instead what they do is they push um, not to the blessed repository, but they push to remote public um, repositories, which which could be forks typically of the blessed repository. Then an appointed pe person or people, the integration manager or managers, will look at these um, public repositories. They will pull they will pull the changes that the developers have pushed into their local local repository. They will do the merge, making sure that um, the holiness of the of the canonical blessed repository is not uh, altered and that everything still works. So the integration manager in this case is responsible for doing a, a good integration according to some policy of best practice and what they want for the code. And finally, the integration manager then has does have right access to the blessed repository and can push directly to the blessed repository. Another workflow, um, the so-called dictator and lieutenants, and and this introduces just some additional, an additional layer essentially. Um, because again, we have the blessed repository, we have developers that are pulling into um, their repositories, making changes which they then um, push to develop, which yeah, they push to develop to lieutenants. And these lieutenants then um, make intermediate decisions about whether or not to scale this up to um, some, uh, overall integration manager who can then push to the best repository. So that's just um, quite a short overview of Git. I've not gone into 
really uh, details of, of, of uh, too much detail about using using Git and doing demonstrations because I've provided some references uh, on the next couple of slides for uh, a practical exercise you can do yourself. So, um, uh, but I really wanted to focus on the virtual tutorial on getting the underlying concepts really clear, um, giving a good basis to start with Git. Um, and just a final, final, some final thoughts are that virtual control systems are not a magic bullet. Uh, they're very powerful, and in fact, they're they're almost dangerously dangerously powerful. Sometimes Git um, can Git can be um, can give you trouble. <laughs> so and uh, it's very easy with Git if you don't know exactly what you're doing um, to shoot yourself in the foot or to end up in a situation where um, you have changes in multiple branches and it's asking you whether you want to so-called stash these changes before you check out a new branch, uh, which can lead to lots of confusion, but I just want to make sure the underlying concepts are clear. The key, one of the other key things is that you will still need to think about how you want to manage your work uh, and decide on this. And in particular, you need to plan with your collaborators on how you're going to, um, how are you going to work collaboratively? Who's going to um, commit? Who's going to have right access? Um, what is the policy for integrating code back? Uh, into a development branch or even the master branch. Um, so these are some references which I would, uh, yeah, very much, very much urge you to have a look at because they go into just a bit more depth than is possible in the time of the, the hour that, that we have for this to have uh, the basic introduction. And the final link in particular talks you through um, a practical exercise using Git that's right, that link there. The quick introduction to version control with Git and GitHub. It's developed by um, uh, Greg Wilson at all, some folks who do software carpentry. And um, it just gets you uh, used to actually doing, doing a practical exercise with Git. So I think, um, so the slides, the slides for this virtual tutorial will be online after, well, later this afternoon. I just wanted to say, point out that um, uh, we have lots of courses, uh, both online for tutorials like this and lots of face-to-face -face courses. All the information is at arch.ac.uk slash training. Um, oh, yeah, it'd be good if you can leave feedback um, on tutorials, including this one with a link. Yes, the link is here for how to provide feedback. There's also the link from the menu on the Archer website. Um, so, yes, I would urge you to have a look at the the references that I give here. They're very nice as a gentle introduction. Um, but I'm going to finish there with this basic introduction. Anybody have any questions? Okay, Git server on Windows. Um, so GitLab, you would be talking, when you talk about Git server, I suppose you mean um, uh, being able to have a, a remote repository that's hosted on a Windows machine um, that you can clone from and push and push to and pull from. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so I think, let me see. I don't know if, I don't know if GitLab runs under Windows. Mm, GitLab on Windows. GitLab installation on Windows is pretty easy, hopefully, maybe. Oh, you need a virtual machine. Okay, it's possible, I think. It's possibly not ideal. What has started happening actually is that um, a lot of um, institutions, universities, um, research institutes have started uh, sort of providing their own um, GitLab infrastructure for the institute as a whole. So, so perhaps you could look into um, installing GitLab. Uh, I would first look around, see if the local IT or research computing support team at your institute is considering or already offering um, some kind of um, Git functionality. Um, I mean, I suppose that's that's because that would give you an alternative to using GitHub if you want to keep your code um, somehow within, within within your own control or have particular policies. Does that answer your question? So. Okay, um, I would suggest that if you have, so just if you're using Git and one thing I would always say, if you're using Git and you're confused and you run into 
trouble you want to reorient yourself git status always go always check git status um there's a lot of a lot of help with git and <clears throat> there are i would say git is not that intuitive in terms of its default behavior sometimes so you would have to look at the manual page to get dash dash git and then the command name and then dash dash help um in many cases there are flags that achieve the, the actual behavior that you might like to happen by default so for example the example i mentioned was when you're creating an uh when you've created a branch which you can actually do either locally as i described or you can if, if there's a remote repository which you're already cloning from you can uh, go on to github or the gitlab instance and uh, create the branch there and then you can pull it and then, or clone it and you won't need to do much more but if you if you've done it in the way i suggest in the, in the presentation, which is to create a branch locally and then try and push it. You will need some additional options like dash dash set upstream um, to make sure that uh, the, there's actually a reference, remote reference created uh, for this for this new branch. So it's things like that which will catch people out um, and which even I think experienced Git users will sometimes find themselves Googling, how do I do this? How do I do that? Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Okay, any final questions? If not, then thanks everyone for attending. I hope that was useful. Goodbye.